Good afternoon. I'm Debbie Herzman, Chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board. I'm here to give you our final update of our on-scene investigative activities and share with you progress since the last briefing yesterday. I'd like to begin by talking about an issue that came up during the press conference yesterday. I was asked by the Korean media about the pilot seeing a light on approach to the airport. During yesterday's press conference, I acknowledged that we had heard that in our interviews. I had an opportunity last night to go back and talk to our investigators in a little bit more detail about his description of the event during the interview. And I'd like to provide you with what he stated to our investigators with respect to what he saw. The pilot flying told the NTSB that about 500 feet while observing the PAPI indicators of three reds and one white, he observed a bright point source of light that could have been a reflection of the sun, but he wasn't sure. The light source was straight in front of the airplane, but not on the runway. He briefly looked away from the light, and then he looked into the cockpit. And he stated that he did not think that the light affected his vision because he could see the flight control instruments, and he was able to look at the speed tape at that time. Neither of the other two flight crew members mentioned this light during their interviews with our investigators and in the review of the cockpit voice recorder there is no discussion on the CVR of the light or of the flying pilot seeing a light. Investigators will determine the relative position of the sun at the time of the landing to help identify any possible sources of momentary reflection that could have been in his field of view. With these data and other factual information, we will take them into consideration with respect to the statements that have made, been made by all of the people that we have interviewed. That was information, again, that was re relayed several days ago to our investigators when they interviewed the flying pilot. So to recap, the flying pilot stated he saw a bright source of light. Neither of the other two pilots identified the source of light. It was not discussed on the CVR. The pilot that saw the light stated that he did not believe that it affected his vision and he was able to see the cockpit instruments. Our, PO, our team, our investigative team, our operations, and our human performance team conducted an interview with the FAA's principal operations inspector that's responsible for overseeing the Asiana Part 129 certificate. And again, when we talk about operators in the United States, if it's a U.S. commercial operator, providing scheduled service in the United States, they're considered Part 121. If it's a foreign air carrier providing scheduled passenger service in the United States, they're covered under Part 129 regulations. And so when I'm referring to a Part 129 carrier, I'm referring to a foreign carrier that's governed by those regulations that are under Part 129. They interviewed the Principal Operations Inspector, also referred to as the POI today. He stated that there's three inspectors that are assigned to Asiana, the POI, the PMI, which is a principal maintenance inspector, and the PAI, which is a principal avionics inspector. The POI has been assigned to Asiana for almost three years, and it is one of 14 certificates that he is responsible for.
Under Part 129 regulations, the inspectors do not conduct in-country inspections. So in this case, this would mean that the inspectors do not conduct inspections in Korea, where the carrier is based, and they do not conduct in-route inspections. And what that means is they cannot sit in the jump seat and observe the crew while they're flying from point to point. What they can do under the Part 129 regulations is they can conduct ramp checks. And ramp checks are cursory evaluations of the air crew and the airplane. So for example, when the plane comes into San Francisco, an FAA POI could conduct an inspection of the crew, of the crew's qualifications, that they're properly licensed, they have uh, current medical. A PMI could conduct an inspection of the aircraft, a cursory inspection of the aircraft, perhaps identifying things that are obvious like bald tires. A PAI is looking at the avionics on the airplane. These are unannounced walk-up inspections, these ramp checks. We talked to the POI about the number of times that Asiana had been contacted by the FAA. And when we talk about contacts, we're, we're talking about any of those three inspectors doing a ramp check, or we're talking about other interactions where they might be asking Asiana for paperwork or other things like that. In the last 18 months, they've had 134 contacts with Asiana. And when we're talking about contacts, again, it could be ramp checks or other interactions with Asiana. So this is between FAA that's responsible for overseeing the carrier under 129 regs and pilots and um, officials with Asiana Airlines. When asked about um, violations or experience with Asiana, the POI reported that they have been a quiet operator with no significant issues during the time that he has been responsible for their certificate. There are 39 Part 129 carriers that are overseen by the FAA's office in LA. The operations and human performance team has collected a lot of records on the pilots, on their history, on their training, their experience. They have a lot of information to review and as soon as they have some time, they're gonna be working to evaluate all of that. That team expects to wrap up their field notes and what that means is continue some of their, uh, complete some of their investigative work here on scene, and they expect to finish up by Saturday. I'd like to provide you a summary of the CVR and FDR findings that have been provided to us from our lab back in Washington. All of those uh, groups the CVR and FDR are expected to complete their initial work today. We talked about the groups that are being convened for the CVR with both Korean and English speakers, pilots who are familiar with the 777. And so they've all been doing that work over the last couple of days and they're providing a little bit of additional information to supplement some of that information that I've already given you over the last four briefings. All of these times are approximate, again, and they'll be finalized when the investigative work is complete. So we're gonna talk about really focused on during the approach at this point. We have a two hour CVR, it goes back a long way, but we're gonna really be talking about um, the, the final minutes as they were on approach. During the, repro during the approach, a crew member, one of the crew members in the cockpit, remember there's three crew members, and so they're all having uh, put the opportunity to provide input here. During the approach, 
there were statements made in the cockpit, first about being above the glide path, then about being on the glide path, and then later in the recording about being below the glide path. All of these statements were made as they were on the approach into San Francisco. So there are statements made first above the glide path, then on glide path, then below glide path. And this happens over, over time, and we're just providing you a summary of some of this information. With some specifics as we're getting closer in, about 35 seconds before impact, there was an automated 500-foot call out, and shortly thereafter, there was a comment from a crew member that the landing checklist was complete. About 18 seconds prior to impact, there is an automated 200-foot call out. About nine seconds prior to impact, there is an automated 100-foot call out. And almost immediately after that is the first comment regarding speed since we started sharing information on starting at 500 feet. So at 500 feet, landing checklist is completed and it, there is no mention of speed until about nine seconds before impact when they're at 100 feet. About five seconds later, and about three seconds before impact, there is a call or for a go around. There is a second call for a go around at 1.5 seconds prior to impact, and this call is made by a different crew member. The FDR group has validated 220 of 1,400 parameters. From the FDR data, the engines and the flight control services appear to be responding as expected to control inputs. There is no anomalous behavior of the autopilot, of the flight director, and of the auto throttles based on the FDR data reviewed to date. Follow on FDR data activities include validating and re reviewing additional relevant parameters and evaluating the quick access recorder to supplement the information that's already covered by the FDR. CV, uh, CVR and FDR team will also be correlating their findings with each other and with the evidence that has been gathered by our team on scene and in addition overlaying information from the crew, crew interviews and air traffic control. When it comes to our other teams who are working here on scene, I'm just going to provide you a summary of the work that they've done. Our systems team has harvest, harvested some avionics, things like the enhanced ground proc system, and they've been sent back to our lab in Washington. They are also working on their field notes and will begin wrapping up their work on scene today as well. Our air traffic control group and our power plants group have completed their on-scene work and they are leaving the site. Our structures team. Last night, the runway was released back to the airport. When the runway was released back to the airport last night, they began to clear the debris. You can see this large debris field here. And for your orientation, this is coming down runway 28 left. You can see immediately in front of you some of those large boulders and rocks from the seawall. 
those rocks were displaced from the seawall and scattered several hundred feet down the runway. And remember, we've talked about the main landing gear striking first and then the tail striking after that, the seawall. In this debris field, you can also see a number of aircraft parts, and I'm going to talk you through some of those. Last night, the salvage operations began to try to remove all of this from the runway so it can be put back into service. They are using cranes and heavy uh, equipment to get the large sections, and you can see here a piece of the tail section depicted. And so some of this work is going to be done with heavy equipment, and some of the work is going to have to be done by hand. Thirty minutes ago, our deputy investigator in charge, and I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Tim LeBaron. I know you all have, have uh, met Bill English. Bill and Tim are working together to lead this investigation. And 30 minutes ago, Tim was talking to the site supervisor out at the accident scene to get an update on the work there. And what Tim found out is that at this time, all of that debris that you can see, and there's an awful lot of it out there, has all been picked up off of runway 28 left and in the areas around runway 28 left. There are two things that remain as far as equipment that the NTSB is interested in. We have all of the slides together that we want to make sure are handled carefully, and we're going to be securing those, packing them up. And yesterday I talked about our efforts to evaluate and test those slides because we had two that deployed in the interior of the cabin post-crash. And the second part is the aircraft. The 777 is a very large structure. It's in the grassy area off of the runway. It is still remaining there. And so our team is still working on that documentation. Yesterday I talked to you about the work of our survival factors team. They're working to document the interior of the cabin. There were over 300 seating positions in the aircraft. As we mentioned, all of the passenger seats stayed inside of the aircraft. We did have three flight attendants in the aft section of the cabin that were ejected with their seats. Our team has been working to document all of the seats that were inside the cabin. There are over 300 of them. And when Tim talked to our team out there again just a short while ago, they told him they were 90% complete. They expected to finish the rest of the documentation by the end of the day. And at that time, we will release the aircraft for the recovery operations, which we expect to commence this evening. Those recovery operations of the, of the aircraft of 214 will entail cutting the aircraft structure and taking the aircraft out piece by piece. It's a big structure. It's going to need to be removed very carefully. And they'll be cutting through the wings to remove sections of the wings, and then cutting through the fuselage to remove sections of the fuselage. That work is going to begin this evening and go on until it's completed. The structure will be re removed to a secure location. And as I've mentioned, we're already taking some of the parts that we're interested in back to our facilities in Washington, D.C. The remaining structure will be secured at a local location, Tim? Okay, so it will be secured at a local uh, hangar that's secured and protected from the elements. Let's talk a little bit more about our survival factors team. That's the crew that's been working out uh, doing the documentation of the cabin. Yesterday, they documented all of the business class seats. They documented the galleys. They documented the forward flight attendant jump seats, all of the doors, and all of the doors were found in the armed position. Remember, there are eight doors and eight slides. Seven of the doors were still attached to the aircraft. One of the doors was found 
outside of the aircraft. Four left was found outside of the aircraft. A status update on the flight attendants. I talked to you yesterday that we had interviewed six of the 12, and there were six that were still hospitalized. As of last night, I was advised that one of the six hospitalized flight attendants had been released. Yesterday, our emergency response group worked on conducting interviews with airport rescue and firefighting officials, with police, with first responders, and airport safety personnel. Yesterday, they had conducted five of those interviews, and they still have 15 interviews that they hope to complete. So that group still has a bit more work ahead of them. From those interviews of the, with the first responders, as you know, after the crash, there was a fire. All of the passengers were evacuated off of the aircraft before the fire was very significant inside the cabin. We have information from firefighters and others who entered the cabin before the fire. And so I'm gonna show you actually some pictures that we've taken on scene, but they are post-fire pictures. And so let me relay to you an observation that is pre-fire. There was a firefighter went in, he went in door two left, and he told our investigators that as he went in door two left and he turned right, that the seats in that section of the aircraft were almost pristine. He said it looked like if you just fluff the pillows a little bit, you could turn the airplane around and it could go out for its next flight, that there was very minimal damage, if any, detectable to him in that section of the aircraft. But as he walked back through the aircraft, it became more and more damaged as he moved aft. He said there was a stark contrast between the front of the aircraft conditions in the cabin compartment and the aft section of the aircraft in the seating compartment. I know you all have seen the photos that we've provided of the aft section of the aircraft. There's no fire damage back there, but there's significant structural damage, and you see a lot of pictures of seats that are jumbled. So that's what he's talking about. The cabin attendants did tell our investigators that the escape path lighting was on during the evacuation and that the Pierre public address system was available for evacuation announcements. I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the observations from our structures team, and our structures team is evaluating the aircraft structure. This photo here is a photo that is post-fire, and so as I talk to you about what that firefighter saw pre-fire, this is the section of the aircraft that he was in that he said looked pristine prior to the fire, that there was very little damage to the seats, to the flooring, to the seating compartment. This is what it looks like post-fire, and our team has been working again to document the cabin and also uh, there's been another team, a contractor, that's come through to try to remove personal effects for all the passengers and get them cleaned and returned to them. So now I'm going to talk to you about, an, about the aircraft and its structure. This is an overview, and we talked to you about this yesterday. And again, the doors just give you some orientation. And again, you can see um, between two and three, Again, that's the section where that photo was taken and also the section that that firefighter entered that they said there was very little damage. So as you're walking from the cockpit to the rear spar of the center wing box, and when we're talking about the center wing box, we're talking about the area in between the two wings in the fuselage area. 
So from the cockpit to the rear of the center wing, uh, to the rear spar of the center wing box, the floor was structurally sound. From the rear spar of the center wing box, aft to, to doors 3R and 3L in the passenger seating compartment, the support structure is compromised on the right side. Our investigators described the floor as being filleted out of the aircraft. But in the same area on the left side, it was still sound. And so what, what you're seeing here is damage that's in the same area, but the left to right damage is different. When you get between doors three and four, the floor is canted down at an angle. The damage is progressively worse as you move from front to back. And then once you get to door four, there is no floor behind door four in the aircraft. And yesterday we talked to you about some of the debris that was found as you walked from the seawall up the runway and we identified cabin flooring, galley uh, materials that were found back on the chevrons right past the seawall as you're approaching the runway threshold. This photo is going to show you the number two engine. We talked about the number two engine a couple of days ago. It's rotated 90 degrees counterclockwise and it's resting against the fuselage. I described the oil tank that ruptured and the fire that occurred in the engine post crash. On the fuselage, you can see evidence of heat and fire damage between the cargo liner and the outside fuselage skin. We see blackening that moves along in an upward pattern consistent with a moving fire. And the firefighters describe this area as the heaviest section of charring. The landing gear. And some of the things that I'm talking to you about have to do with things that we've identified as facts, but they're important to take note of. The escape path lighting worked. The PA system worked. We see here landing gear that separated cleanly from the aircraft as designed. Landing gear is designed to be frangible so that it can separate from the aircraft in the event of something like this. And it performed as designed. It's important that the landing gear separate so it won't create a safety hazard. And that's connected to the next area that I want to brief you on, which has to do with the fuel tanks. The fuel tanks were not breached. And this is important because when coupled with that frangible landing gear performing as designed, we don't see a fuel-fed fire. <coughs> the fire that we saw was not as a result of punctured fuel tanks. We've had a very busy few days here in San Francisco. When the NTSB does our work, we can't do it alone. Whenever we come to an accident site, we're supported by many other people. We have a party system where we have technical experts who aid our investigators in the work that they do. We have had excellent cooperation from that party system. That also includes having support from our Korean counterparts the KRAB, the Korean Aviation and Rail Accident Investigation Board, and they have come to be a part of our investigation. I talked to my counterpart this morning, Chairman Cho. They have been great partners 
and assistance in our work. The FBI has been invaluable to our team while we've been on site. The San Francisco field office has provided support to our team and also ERT teams, evidence response teams, and hazmat teams flew in from Quantico, from FBI facilities in Quantico, to assist our investigators. We talked about that work that was being done, that total station GPS work. The FBI was very involved in that. Some of the aerial photos that you've seen, the FBI assisted in taking those. They provided us uh, assistance with evidence, handling, and translations. United Airlines has provided our team with meeting space and they're assisting in the salvage efforts. This has been very invaluable. We don't have a facility here. We very much appreciate that. The Red Cross has been out on scene, making sure that the investigators and the teams working on the recovery operations of the personal effects and the salvage operations have food and water. They've been at the Family Assistance Center providing support for the families who are there, for the survivors who are there. The Salvation Army has provided clothes for the survivors that didn't have any luggage. And United at the Family Assistance Center. United's a, a code share partner with Asiana. United Airlines stepped up in a huge way after this disaster. If they had not been here to provide assistance for the survivors and the family members, it would not have been effective in the first hours and days after the crash. They deployed a charter plane from Chicago with over 50 people to come support those survivors and the family members, and they have really done a great job stepping up to help another air carrier when it comes to support of families of victims and survivors post-crash. San Francisco Airport, of course, uh, this has been a serious event, initially closing two runways for them. Another runway remains closed. They have been terrific. Uh, we know that it's been an inconvenience for them, but they have gone out of their way to provide assistance to our investigators and make sure that we could get our work done and not pressure us. Uh, they want that airport open, so I want you to know they've put pressure on us, but they have not pressured us in a way uh, that forced us not to get our job done, and we very much appreciate that. Very often when we arrive on scene, uh, we, have, we have jurisdictional challenges. None of that happened here. We have had outstanding cooperation. And the federal, state, and local officials have all stayed in close contact with us. They've had regular briefings from us. But they have made sure that our investigative team could get their work done and that they supported us. And so from the governor down to the mayor and our senators and representatives from California, they have been tremendous advocates for making sure that a complete and thorough investigation has been done. We very much appreciate their support of our work. I'm happy to stand for a final round of questions from you. Yes, sir. The question is, can I provide an update on the family members and survivors who are still here and what they may be doing? Really out of respect for the families of the victims and the survivors and their privacy, I'm here to comment on the NTSB's accident investigation activities. The Family Center is set up to provide them with some privacy and opportunity to take care of their immediate needs. Um, they did. Uh, have a site visit last night. There were three buses that were taken out to the site uh, for those family members and survivors that wanted to go out for a site visit, but I'm really not going to be commenting uh, on anything about the families of the victims or the survivors. Yes, in the back.
standard in terms of calling out speed on a program? The question is uh, that it was about nine seconds before impact where there was a 100-foot call out, and shortly thereafter was the first time that there was a reference uh, made to speed. 500 foot level when I when I relayed to you some points and what would have been typical procedures what I'm relaying to you is what is on the cockpit voice recorder this is factual information um, there it, there are um, expectations that the crew is monitoring speed as they're on approach again we've talked about their target speed of 137 knots what I'm telling you is that from 500 feet until just after the 100-foot automated call-out, that there are no comments on the CVR related to speed. It's not until shortly after that 100-foot call-out that we hear the discussion about speed. We've already talked extensively about that last 10 seconds and some of the things that happened during that time period. Alan. There's a question about a comment that was made in an interview by the relief first officer who was sitting in the jump seat uh, about sink rate that he said to our um, interviewers that he acknowledged, made a call out regarding sink rate at some point in the, in the approach and the descent. And the question is, did we hear that on the CVR and when did it occur? What I can tell you is talking to our team that reviewed the CVR is what is that there was a call out that was made about sink rate. They're working now to identify who might have made that call out, but it was prior to this to this 500 feet that I'm sharing with you. I don't know when it was, but they did verify that there was a call out regarding sink rate in the back. The question is, um, the media was briefed on the account uh, provided by the instructor pilot uh, several days ago, and if there were additional comments or information gleaned from the interviews with the other two pilots who were in the cockpit, is that the question, with the relief first officer and the flying pilot, and if there were any specific discrepancies between the comments made by those pilots. What I've shared with you is some pertinent information that we feel is valid based on the, the review of the cockpit voice recorder. We feel confident in that information. Uh, we can share it with you. Um, we are also sharing with you information as relayed through um, our investigative team about the interviews. I had a good deal of information about the instructor pilot. He was one of the first pilots that was interviewed. When I briefed you on the other pilot, on the flying pilot, it was actually um, a really short window for me to turn that information to come back to you, and so that's probably why there's uh, not the same amount of information. But what I can tell you is that our investigators are working on all of their notes, these were extensive interviews. Each of the interviews was about four hours each. There was a lot of information gained from the interviews with all the pilots. And again, it's important for us to listen to what the pilots shared with us during their interviews, but also cross-check that with the, what the other two pilots said and with the cockpit voice recorder. And so one example of that is what we talked about when I first started and the comments about the light the light was only mentioned by one pilot, not by the other two, and there was no discussion of it on the CVR. There's a lot of cross-checking that needs to happen. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to provide information after we leave the scene through periodic written updates, and 
We also have a process going forward about uh, what we will do as far as next steps. And so maybe I'll brief you on that. When the NTSB is on scene, we provide regular press briefings. When we finish our on-scene work and go back to our offices, our investigators, many of whom are working multiple investigations, this isn't the only accident that they are working on, they will begin to collect additional information if they need to visit Boeing with respect to structures or systems or performance, uh, they will do that. If other investigators need to go elsewhere, um, they will make those arrangements uh, to visit training facilities and other things. There will be a decision made within the next few months about whether or not to convene an investigative hearing. We generally tell people it takes us 12 to 18 months to complete our final reports. However, this is a very significant event. There is a lot of interest in it, and we want to make sure that we complete this investigation as expeditiously as possible. And so I will tell you it's going to be a high priority for our agency, and we'd look at getting close to or under that 12-month mark. Now what that means is that it's our final report, the final delivery, but throughout the coming year and in the coming weeks and days, if we identify any safety issues that we believe need to be addressed immediately, we can issue recommendations and those recommendations can come at any time. The NTSB does not have any authority to force anyone to adopt our recommendations. We're an investigative agency. We're charged by Congress with determining the probable cause of the accident and issuing recommendations to improve safety. And so it's up to our, our, the people that receive our recommendations to actually adopt or implement them. I'll take more questions now. Thank you for letting me explain our process. Mike. Mike Hollis with CNN. Uh, yesterday, some of the 911 tapes were released, and on those tapes, some of the callers uh, complained about delays in getting ambulances uh, on the scene. Uh, has the fire department provided you with the response times? Uh, what can you tell us about those response times, and uh, is there any indication that there was delays in getting uh, uh, help to the injured? The question has to do with the uh, survivors of the accident and the response times of the ambulances and emergency response vehicles and if there, was, if there were any delays or if that response was slow. Um, we are looking at all of that information. Obviously, we have, a, have really mountains of information to go through. We have recorded material. We have 911 calls. We have video. We need to put all of that information together. While we have been here, we have put out a great deal of information. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more that we have to review before we get to the end of this process. Our teams have been working hard to do the perishable things. Document the aircraft, interview witnesses. All of those other records are being collected and they will be reviewed in time. On this side, in the first row. You have multiple questions, okay? So let me, let me I'm going to take the last one first. Um, again, this is a question that's very similar to the question that was asked earlier, and it has to do with Korean uh, media reports and a question that was asked yesterday about the sink rate and the comments from the first officer, the relief first officer who was sitting in the jump seat. And this is the sink rate question that was asked earlier. The specific question that was asked here was he made a statement that he made, he made a call out regarding sink rate at 54 seconds prior to impact. Again, that is very specific information uh, that he's remembering. 
For us, we need to look at the recorder and uh, the flight data recorder and corroborate all of that information. I did state that on the cockpit voice recorder, we did hear a call out regarding sync rate at some point. And I will tell you that with respect to 54 seconds before the approach, that correlates to about 1,000 feet. But what I'm not saying is that the sync rate call came at 1,000 feet. I'm just telling you we have to match those up. I'm hearing 54 seconds from you. I'm not sure how the first officer remembered 54 seconds, but we need to match that up. The information that I gave to you about monitoring speed today, that started, remember, at 500 feet. You had another question? The question is, can I be more specific on the role of auto throttles? Yesterday we talked about the auto flight systems and what those systems do for pilots, how they support and aid them. They can reduce workload. Auto throttles are one component of that. Auto throttles are used to um, manage power, and it depends on which mode that the aircraft is in as to how the auto throttles were, will perform. I mentioned yesterday that there are five different modes that you could expect to see in flight uh, with respect to the auto throttles. Yes, sir, in the second row. Uh, Thank you, Lee, you're in the seniors. Um, Madam Chairman, we hear reports from South Korea that there was, I guess, a personnel switch within the SFO control tower 30 seconds before impact of the, uh, of the airliner, uh, that there was not, it would suggest that perhaps the The question is that they have heard from the South Korean media that there was a switch of personnel in the control tower at San Francisco, 30, 30 seconds, sorry. 30 seconds uh, prior to what? The impact is what, is what we're reporting. 30, that there's a report in the Korean media that there was a personnel switch in the control tower 30 seconds prior to impact, and the question is, did did that indicate that the Asiana Crew 214 was not getting good support from air traffic control? Is that the question? Yes, Yesterday I showed you some plots of the aircraft. I also showed you uh, points in time and altitude uh, fixes where the air crew was talking to the tower. They received their final clearance, their landing clearance a minute and a half or 90 seconds prior to impact. So I'm not sure about a 30 second prior to impact crew change, but the last communication with the air traffic control tower occurred 90 seconds or a minute and a half before. And the flight, um, when the aircraft hit the seawall, the tower actually called for the emergency and the emergency vehicles prior to the flight crew calling the tower on for an emergency. And so there's an allegation uh, that 30 seconds prior to impact there was a crew change at ATC. Did that affect uh, the service that the crew was provided? And I've told you 90 seconds out they had their last contact with ATC. They got their landing clearance and that the air traffic control personnel called for the rolling of the emergency response vehicles before the pilots requested them. Matt. Matt, well, New York Times, thank you. The checklist that they said that they completed 500 feet out, does that checklist uh, tell them to check the status of the auto throttles or to check their speed? The question is, the landing checklist that was called completed about 500 feet out did that landing checklist have uh, a check auto throttles or component speed. or a check speed component? I don't know the answer to that, but certainly our team will be evaluating that. I know that they are looking at the checklist. Again, that's one of the pieces of information. We've got a mountain of information that we've collected. We're trying to go through the things that are important to do here on scene. All of that will be reviewed 
uh, as we return back to headquarters in the front row. How about Denise? Yeah. The question is, is there any indication that the passengers might have turned on electronics that could have affected the landing? And the answer to that question is, I have received that question before um, from some of the family members, and we have no indication at this point in time that any personal electronics interfered with the performance of the aircraft. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate uh, all of your efforts.